I'm trying to get my head around this idea of the kind of variation you said that we see across humans, but then when we look genetically, we're pretty similar. And uh, part of my understanding of that was that we're pretty mobile, or we've been pretty mobile, so we've been able to move around and interbreed. What happens if we compare that to something like wolves that I think is similar in terms of being very mobile and likely to interbreed? Do we see the same kind of, you know, how, how do we fit on that scale? I noticed on your graph, wolves showed relatively, yeah. So can you go with that? You know, I think what it is, and I hope this microphone's working right, is that humans have, have uh, spread out everywhere in the world so quickly. So they're in very different uh, uh, climates. And the selection pressures are quite strong in, those, in, the, in the wide range of climates they are. In fact, you do see some selection pressures, for instance, for people who moved up to high latitudes and there were certain genes, that, certain gene variants that were favored in those high latitudes. So I think it's the speed of movement and the variety of environments in which people find themselves. I'm not an expert on any of these other animal species, but I have a feeling they often tend to, to move across particular latitudes, for instance, that there's not a, not, not a lot of north-south movement. And, and then wolves, and, and part of it's the history that humans expanded so quickly. When a, when a species has been around for a lot longer, there are more opportunities for it to develop uh, pockets of genetic differences that then show up in the, when, you, when you look at the genetic variation in that species. Karen might know a little more about this, actually, because you know, she, she studies these kinds of, uh, what I was looking at is just the variation within a single species, but the spar coding project is very interesting in that you can see the differences between species, including closely related ones. So I actually don't know, I'm not, I'm not trying to put her on the spot, but maybe she knows some of this. <laughs> You're not trying to put me on the spot, but you're going to do it anyways. <laughs> um, I think it's I think it's tricky to track uh, that kind of thing with DNA because um, if you're looking within species, you use different bits of DNA than you use to look between species. So an individual investigator would pick their question and decide to work on it. Um, and if you were using DNA barcoding, for example, you would probably not find anything of interest about um, the history of a single species. So while the techniques are related, I'm not sure that they're, I'm not sure that, that it would speak to um, uh, intraspecific variation the way that some of the work that your scientist colleagues on the Nature paper, for example, might have been doing within human species. Sorry, I didn't really answer your question. <laughs> uh, yeah, my question is for uh, Dr. Olson. I was wondering, so I'd always learned that um, we had a common uh, female ancestor through mitochondrial Eve uh, 200,000 years ago. How does that relate to um, your um, research that found that we have a common ancestor uh, 3,500 years ago? Like, what's the difference between those two? Yeah, so we do have a, a, a common female ancestor. That's the woman from whom everyone gets their mitochondrial DNA. But in fact, we have common female ancestors much, much more recently than that. Um, and, uh, but, but it's through all lines of descent. In other words, we all get our mitochondria. Remember my, the, the, the uh, genealogy that I showed there? Well, for men, their Y chromosome comes down the, the what is that? That's the right side of their genealogy. And their mitochondrial DNA comes down the left side. It gets passed from woman to woman to woman to woman all the way down. Um, you know, there's an analogous situation, and it's in Judaism. Um, uh, uh, among Jews, the uh, Kohanim are the direct male descendants of Aaron, Moses' brother. And there's some genetic evidence, it's disputed, uh, that, that there may be some basis in reality for that particular story, that uh, in fact many of those men do appear to be descended from the same man, whether it was Aaron, we don't know. But in fact, all of us are descended from Aaron, but we're descended from Aaron through men and women, whereas the Kohanim are only descended through the male line. And, <clears throat> and, and so that's, that's the difference in, in these things. But it is, it is the case that when I published this book, everyone said, oh no, the common ancestor of human beings had to have been 10 or 20,000 years ago, or maybe even 50,000, because that's when mitochondrial Eve lived. But no, <clears throat> it turns out that if you look at both lines of descent through both men and women, it's much more, com much more recent than that. Um, I've, I'd heard that uh, Genghis Khan uh, populated half the world. I, is, that a, is that an exaggeration? Oh, no, no. Well, uh, you know, <clears throat> uh, to, he, he populated it uh, perhaps to a slightly greater degree than everybody else. Yeah, we're all related to Genghis Khan, pro 
probably, what, when did Genghis Khan live? 1,200 or 1,300 or something like that. Um, we're certainly descended, everyone in here is descended from Charlemagne. Whether we're all descended from Genghis Khan is another question. Uh, but for instance, uh, <clears throat> I wrote an op-ed, probably the, the thing I've uh, written that has been most widely reprinted uh, came out on the day of the Da Vinci Code, because I wrote an op-ed for the Los Angeles Times that said, you know, the, there's a lot of ridiculous things in the Da Vinci Code, right? Oh, has, it, has everybody read it? So I won't be ruining it for people. <laughs> Darn, too late. The Da Vinci Code is about how just a small group of people is, are descended from Jesus. Um, and I said, well, that's ridiculous. If anyone on the planet today is descended from Jesus, then we're all descended from Jesus. That's just the way human genealogy works. So it's, it's just the, the bizarre mathematics of genealogy. You know, is it just a parlor game, this whole, this whole business with genealogy? In other words, it doesn't necessarily change our genetic understanding of how we all get our genes. But genealogies is, are how genes get passed down from one generation to the next. So I think there is some interesting overlap between the two. Hi, uh, thank you, Karen, for that review on the uh, Voyage of the Beagle. That was a nice refresher from reading it several years ago. Um, uh, really, there wasn't too much controversial uh, tonight. I'm your friendly neighborhood creationist. Uh, and um, according to Steve's talk, um, hi, cuz. <laughs> um, <laughs> Now you know you're related to a creationist. Um, <laughs> oh no. Anyway, I wanted to just read a, a, an interesting quote. You may have heard it before um, in the introduction, Origin of Species. Um, a fair result can be obtained only by fully stating and balancing the facts and arguments on both sides of each question. And this here is impossible, which is understandable because he was writing a, a book addressing a, a very big topic. He didn't have time to back and forth on everything. But um, one thing that, you know, this could be to either one of you, um, but uh, I teach at a small, dinky, liberal arts school in, in town. And in my interactions with various people, the one I disagree with a lot of things he has to say, but this is one, one thing that I really, really agree with, uh, uh, with uh, Charles Darwin. And, and I was wondering, uh, just my question, why, why do you think uh, most biology faculty at, at secular universities are diametrically opposed to this approach um, today? It seems to me, my experience. The approach being creationism. No, the approach being oh, um, to, uh, fully stating and balancing the facts and arguments on both sides of each question. Because um, uh, there are highly controversial questions in biology, and it's usually the students, um, undergraduates and graduate students, only get uh, the, the party line. And yes, they're introduced to intramural controversies within the Di Darwinian paradigm, but um, uh, not exposed to um, informed um, dissent outside the paradigm. Okay, so I'm gonna start this question. I'm not a biologist, and then I'm gonna, but I'm, sure. I'm just gonna start with my impressions, then I'll hand the microphone to a biologist, which is that, um, you know, from all of my reading of biology, the evidence for evolution is just so overwhelming that it's very hard for most biologists to consider possibilities because uh, it's, it's hard for them to find other kinds of evidence. Now, I'll certainly acknowledge that there's lots of interesting questions in evolutionary biology. My gosh, it's just full of them. But no one is looking at the question of whether evolution has happened because the evidence for that is, is so great. So let me, let me see how Karen responds to that. Um, okay, so I think that uh, as, as a biology faculty, I guess I can represent yeah. biology faculty. Sure. Um, <clears throat> the way we do science, and I like to think the way we teach science, or the way we should probably teach science, um, is to uh, think experimentally. Um, mm -hmm. The way that Darwin thought, and the way that we think when we work in our labs today, 
And when we think experimentally, we have a hypothesis and we have a null hypothesis and, and we try to generate evidence um, that um, is consistent with either the hypothesis or the null hypothesis or the hypothesis and um, we bash our hypotheses to tiny little pieces trying to break them. And if we can't, we say, we don't say the hypothesis was proved, we say it was not disproved. Right. And uh, since you've read Origin of Species, you know that Darwin bashed his hypothesis with many hammers and to tiny little pieces and said in many places with utmost hu humility, really, that uh, if anyone found evidence like X, uh, it would totally discredit my theory and I would walk away from it. And um, that was in, um, that was over 150 years ago and um, people ha have been trying all this time. When I test a hypothesis, when I do an experiment in my lab to look at the DNA sequences of different species, I'm testing Darwin's hypothesis. I'm not writing a paper about it because it would never get published. Everyone would say, well, we knew that already. But I'm testing Darwin's hypothesis. Hundreds, thousands of us are testing his hypothesis all the time. And we are not able to find anything that disproves it. Right. Well, I won't eat up the, the um If we the could, mic. we just want to keep... keep yeah, yeah, I Thanks, understand. Gordon. I'd like to talk to you afterwards. Sure. That'd be great. Thanks, Gordon. Um, hi, so are we going to be, all be descendants of Darwin in a couple hundred years? <laughs> just, just, Apparently that's, so. That's, I'm <laughs> sorry, that's, that's not my real question. <laughs> my, my real question is for Dr. James, and I'm just curious that you went to Darwin's backyard and you actually um, took you know, the species kind of census or whatever you did, and you found the same number of taxa uh, generally. Were they the same species and genera that he found? And have you done any DNA um, extraction and experimentation to find out whether, basically my question is, whether evolution took place in that backyard? Um, most certainly it was, has been taking a place and is taking place, but we did extract DNA from, I had to skip over that part pretty fast or go through it pretty fast, but um, we, we, to answer your first question, we found roughly the same number of species and we don't know yet if they're the same ones or different ones. They are, many of them are very likely the same ones because if we look at the floras that were written that Darwin probably used, they have a lot of the same ones in there and you wouldn't expect in 150 years that it would have changed so dramatically. But uh, what we don't know is maybe are 10% different, are 5% different, um, and we're looking for that long lost list, his long lost list of species to be able to answer that. We did um, take DNA to uh, uh, work on our, our um, question of which bits of DNA should be used for this DNA based species identification in plants, which was actually a global project with people contributing DNA from species all around the world, and our little bit just so happened to be from downhouse. Um, but we weren't looking at questions related to the change, genetic change in the plants in that meadow. Um, there are people who spend their entire research career so looking at those questions. <laughs> it's just not me. All right, we'll take two more questions and then we'll wrap it up. Hi, this is a question for Dr. James. Um, this is kind of more of a zoology question, so I know it's sort of maybe not quite, you know, the botany field, but um, when I took some zoology classes, you know, way, way, way back when, so maybe my knowledge is a little bit outdated, they were talking about speciation events and that sometimes you can have species that are two, two different populations, like, say, mice on one side of the canyon, mice on the other side of the canyon. Even though they're genetically similar enough to produce viable offspring, they're not considered the same species because they have a physical barrier that makes it so that they can't breed, right? So what I'm wondering about is when you're doing your um, testing on population research, is that kind of confirming and justifying that distinction? In it's almost like semantics when they're saying, well, they're different species, even though they're technically not. You know what I'm saying? Like, are you finding that the DNA is confirming that, that you know, nomenclature? Or 
are they doing that anymore? That's kind of my question. That's a great question. Um, so a couple of things. The, the bits of DNA that, that we work with to tell different species apart are different bits than the sort of people um, who ask that question use. And the reason I'm raising that is because in one area of the DNA, you might see a lot of divergence even within species, say between two different populations on either side of a canyon. But in, an, in a nearby region of DNA, they might be identical. And that's because you get different mutation rates across the genome. Um, and so you would expect kind of different molecular clock rates at different places on the genome. So I'm saying that because if we looked at the genes that I worked on in those two populations of mice, we might find they are identical. And someone might want to conclude that, therefore, they're not two separate species. But if we looked at it slightly, different area of the genome, we might find the opposite conclusion. So there's really no silver bullet when it comes to um, uh, looking at any one region of the genome and answering that question. That said, if you look at many different places of the genome and you track how many are shared between the different um, uh, populations, you can actually measure something called gene flow. And gene flow is an indicator of interbreeding. And interbreeding is one of the definitions that we use for species. But generally, species is a concept that is inside of our heads, and there are fuzzy boundaries around them. So it, it doesn't always match up. Um, de it depends on what tools you use. I know I'll add one thing to that. You know, a, a fun, uh, I mentioned a, a book, uh, probably only the older people in this audience have read Clan of the Cave Bear. But, you know, it was a very popular book back in the 70s. It's about modern humans coming out of Africa and encountering Neanderthals and what happens. And uh, it relates to your question <laughs> in sort of a fun science fiction-y way. Okay, let's take our final question. Uh, this is a question for Steve. So in the graph, uh, the graphic that you showed percent similarity over time and um, essentially, you know, essentially then at, what, 2500 BC, uh, it percent similarity goes way up, right? Well, about halfway up in that ascent, you know, somewhere around 60% similarity or so at about roughly, what, seven, 800, 1,000 BC, mm -hmm. there's like a kink in it. Yeah. What's with that? I don't know, that's a, that's a strange thing. Uh, well, it's an you know, event of some kind. I mean, it's gotta be important. Yeah, you know, if there are physicists here, uh, it reminds me of back in, in my physics days. You know, in physics, there's a phase change where things yeah, change sure, very sure. gradually, and then all of a sudden there's a phase change. That's actually how it works with ancestry as well. We yeah. have a relatively small number of ancestors until suddenly there's a phase change, and everybody's our ancestor. And so I suspect that that kink is, is a similar thing going on, but in this larger population when you actually run the model. That's my guess. Very cool. <laughs> All right. Well, everybody, thank you. We really hope you join us at the after party. It's at One World Cafe. Um, and we'll see you next year. Thank you very much. <laughs>